morning, everyone. We're going to sing a brand new song, page number nine in the book. Once again, we come to the house of God. Would you stand, please? Good morning, Internet. Bless you. Sing with us if you know the song. If you don't, maybe you can learn it while we're here. Number nine, once again, we come. Sing it like it's the first time you ever sang it before. Here we, I, I, I got to say this. Brother Charlie Craig, you know, is so forward with everything he says. He said, I hate that song. He said, somewhere he went to church out west where he lived for a long time. He said, every Sunday morning we sang that song. And Charlie is not backwards about expressing himself. But it's not that case here. So once again, we're here. Praise the Lord for the privilege we have of being together and singing the songs of Zion. And whoever wrote this had a, a full knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he expected of us when we come together. Sing the song. <laughs> First word. Once again we come to the house of God to unite in songs of praise, to extol with joy our Redeemer's name, and to tell His wondrous ways. To the house, O oh Lord, with rejoicing we come, for we know that we are thine. We will worship Thee. In the Bible way, as evening light does shine. In the days gone by, thou hast been our stay, thou hast led us safely on to the blessed light of the present day, where the darkness now is gone. Sing it now to the house of oh Lord with rejoicing we come for we know that we are thine we will worship thee in the bible way as he keeps singing shine may our hearts O oh lord and united be in true fellowship and love may thy will be done by us here on earth as my angel host above to the house O oh lord with rejoicing we come for we know that we are thine we will worship thee in the bible way as the evening light does shine we got one more verse one more chance to smile and sing it all right, let's try that for a change. May our prayers, O oh Lord, air you. Keep singing. As in gratitude, all our hearts o'erflow in a tribute unto thee. To thy house, O oh Lord, with rejoicing we come, for we know that we are thine. The Bible way has he chorus one more time to the house O oh Lord with rejoicing we come for we know that we are thine we will worship thee in the Bible way as the evening light does shine blessed be the name blessed be the name Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Remain standing, please. Well, good morning. We do welcome you all this morning, and it's my pleasure to open the service, I guess, for the first time ever, so hopefully I don't mess things up now that I've got the whole internet watching me as well. <laughs> but <clears throat> this verse always uh, comes to mind, you know, on a, on a Sunday morning when we're 
uh, head in the church, uh, Hosea, he told uh, the nation of Israel, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, till he come and rain righteousness upon you. So I just I always think of that, that verse, because now is the time to seek the Lord and his righteousness. Uh, we do have a few prayer requests uh, that we want to remember. Um, certainly want to remember Brother Hensley and, uh, and his daughter Haley as they return back from uh, Guatemala. I heard that they did accomplish their goal of building a house in, I think, four days. I'd maybe like them to work on my house if they can build one in four days. They should maybe fix one in four days, right? Um, also, uh, in our Sunday school class this morning... Uh, uh, brother uh, Bob Romine brought up that uh, Brother Nice had passed away, so we want to remember his family. Um, also, I'm told there's several unspoken requests that we need to be praying for. Um, and then also Larry Mercer and Vicki Lewis and uh, Carissa as well. Um, and I know that uh, Brother Hensley's had some stuff, I think, on Facebook. There's a baby, I want to say, in Oklahoma or somewhere that uh, they've been praying for. It has some... Uh, medical issues as well. Um, also, if there's any other unspoken requests, we'll receive those with the upraised hand at this time. So many there. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this uh, morning, Father, that you've given us and this gathering this morning, Father. Lord, we gather to uh, worship you, Father, and to praise your holy name, Lord. Uh, Father, we are thankful for the plan of salvation, Father, and how you have uh, reached out, Father, to sinners like us, Father. Lord, that you have uh, transformed so many lives, Father, through uh, Jesus Christ, Father, and you uh, lead us by your Spirit on a daily basis, Lord. And Father, I do just pray that you would uh, be with us as we uh, worship you today in song and in preaching, Father. We just pray that you would uh, bless the preaching of your word, Father, that it would be to your honor and glory. And Father, that you would uh, give us each what we stand in need of, Father, this day from your word, Lord. Uh, Father, you said that your word will not go out without having an effect on us, Lord, and, and on lives, Father. And Lord, we uh, think of these several requests, Father, that have been brought forward. Lord, we're thankful for our missionary brethren, Father, and those that are willing to go out onto the field, uh, Father, and to uh, preach your word, Father, and to help others and to show the love of Jesus Christ to the rest of the world, Father. And Lord, we pray that you would be in each and every one of those places, Father. Lord, we know that we have brothers and sisters around the world, Father, that uh, have woken up in lands where they are persecuted for uh, their belief and testimony of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that you would be with each and every one of those individuals, Father. Lord, that the testimonies would continue to go forth, Lord, in this land and others, Father, that lives may continue to be saved, Father. And Lord, I just pray that you would uh, just be with us, Lord, the rest of this day. You saw the hands, Father, and the uh, burdens and needs, Father, lost loved ones, Lord, that uh, need to be saved, Lord. And Father, we just pray for each and every one of those requests. We pray for uh, Brother Hensley and Haley's safe return, Father. We pray for uh, these that are uh, ill, and, and Lord, just be with each and every one, Lord. And we thank you for all that you do for us, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Gave me the victory, set my footsteps. 
have to walk the right. Give me eyes to see the light. This is the day that the Lord has. I place my faith, my rock and my fortress, in you I find a hiding place, even though I walk through the valley of death, under your wings my soul will rest, this is the day. Church, let the church. 
I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. inseparable from real glory. Hallelujah. Turn to page number 28. Haven't sung this song for a while either. Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. While we take our morning tithes and offering. Number 28. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name. All ye hosts together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye heavens of heaven and floods above the sky. Let them praise his gift to hope, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted. And praises give Jehovah, they were made at his command. Then forever he established, his decree shall ever stand. From the earth, oh, praise Jehovah, all ye but ye dragons old, fire and hail and snow and vapor, stormy winds. That hear his call. Let him praise his gift, Jehovah, for his name above his throne. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted. For All ye fruitful trees and all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and set. <laughs> Kings of earth and all ye people, princes, great earth judges all, praise his name, ye 
jumping and maidens age at me and children smoke. Let me praise him, Jehovah, for his name upon his throne, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted. Far above the earth and sky. Amen. Amen. Mia has a song this morning. Where is Mia? There she comes. She don't stick up very far. <laughs> I hear the pit patter from the raindrops. I like the buzz, buzz, buzz from the bees. But She's struggling with her party dress there this morning, too. God bless her. Glad to have Van Syox this morning. Sister Helen has a song before the message today. I saw Brother Tony a couple weeks ago at Watts, and he said, once you come, and when you come, bring a song with you. So that's what I did. But um, I was thinking as I was uh, thinking of this song on the way here, my mom was a quiet person, unlike me. Um, she didn't say a lot as far as, she was shy and standing up and testifying. But as a little girl growing up at home, my mom sang, and a few uh, months ago, I recorded a CD of some songs that my mom sang as a, when I was a little girl, and they stuck with me. This was one of them, His Eye is on the Sparrow. That's okay. Track two. Track two. <laughs> Technology is good when it works, isn't it? <laughs> okay, um, Brenda, can you play his eyes on? Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he, his eye is on the sparrow, and 
I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled. These tender words I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose my doubt and my fear. Though by the path he leadeth, just one step I may see. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing. His eye is on the sparrow, and this is the best part, and I know that he watches me. Yes, go ahead, Sister Effie. Amen. Yes, amen. Amen. Here's an announcement. The youth trip to Guatemala is having a rum and sale at church Friday and Saturday, September 7th and 8th from 9 to 3. We appreciate any items you would like to donate, and they can be dropped off at church and given to Bruce and Sherry Romig. So if you will, be thinking about some of your junk that you want to give away. That would be another man's treasure. <laughs> Amen. Good to see everybody. If you have your Bible, turn to the Gospel of John. And we're going to, well, let's start with verse 1 and then drop down to verse 6. John, the first chapter. In the beginning was the word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. Just think about that. The Word is Jesus Christ. And listen to what John is saying. In the beginning was the Word. 
And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The Jews came to Jesus one day and they said uh, to Jesus, you think you're better than our father Abraham? And Jesus looked at them and said, before Abraham, I was. Amen. Amen. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John, referring to John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all, man, all men through him might be saved, believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. From Malachi to John the Baptist, there was 400 years and there was rank darkness over the earth. Men didn't know who God was. Men didn't know anything. They were worshiping idols, this, that, and everything. Paganism was on the scene when Jesus showed up. And so John makes it clear that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. I wish they'd get back to teaching that in our schools. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Speaking of the Jewish nation. But as many as received him... To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John's talking about a whole new birth here, not a natural birth, but a birth that comes down from God out of heaven. And when a man is born again of the Spirit of God, he sees this world in a whole new way. And the Word was made flesh. Talking about the incarnation. And dwelt among us. He actually come down into this world and walked among men. He dwelt among us, and while he dwelt among us, we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What a powerful text. While we recognize the limitations of our human minds to comprehend God's greatness. Nevertheless, John highlights three magnificent truths of our Lord's greatness. In verse 10, John says, the world was made by him. That is the absolute truth about the existence of our world. The absolute truth of the existence of our earth. The world was made by him. Secondly, he says of our Lord, he was in the world. That is a supreme fact of history. And thirdly, the world knew him not. That is the supreme tragedy of all of humanity. He came into the world. And the world knew him not. They did not comprehend. They did not understand. How in the world they missed it is, is, is a mystery. Because it was so obvious when Jesus came into the world that he was the son of the living God. The world was made by him, John says. We cannot be shocked by the audacity of this statement. John does not argue about it or hesitate about whether or not 
this thing was true. It came from the mind of God. He knows that it is just as true as it is tremendous. John knew before Galileo and all of them, and they all come along. He knew that the world was made by him. Him who? The word. The word who? Jesus Christ. Amen? That this Jesus was God coming to this earth as a man through a real human birth. And before all the geological ages came up with their scientific speculations, for example, the Big Bang, the Bang Theory, which is the leading explanation about how the universe began, Jesus gave this earth its existence. All sorts of ideas were afloat back then concerning the earth's origin, including evolution theories. But over against them all, John sets the record straight. The world was made by him. Thus, the origin of this world is creation, not evolution. And if you're in a college classroom or in a high school classroom and a teacher stands up and tries to tell you that this world just evolved and a big bang happened and out of that come the earth, you just stand up and tell them that is not the truth. The Bible said the world was made by him. Thus, the origin, origin of the world is creation, not evolution. Listen to John in verse 3. All things were made by him. All things. Everything was made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. he done it all. He made it all. He created it all. The Milky Way, the Big Dipper, uh, this, that, and the other creations. The mountains, the waters, the sun. He made everything. The reason the devil and his gang wants humans to believe the origin of the universe evolved naturally is because it eliminates God as the creator of all things. And there has been science that has been trying to get rid of God and dethrone God for, for centuries. But the more they try to get rid of him, the more he shows up. Thank God for that. So he was the creator of all things. But when people try to say that we evolved naturally or some other way the world was created, it removes the truth of intelligent design. And when you are left with intelligent design, when you are left with man evolved and was not created by God, you are left with this atheistic view of life which leads to moral collapse and a fatalistic outcome and leaves you with a philosophy for life which says, let's eat and let's drink and let's be merry, for tomorrow we die. But John says the world was made by him. Then there is good purpose in the universe and not just blind chance. To the atheist, everything which happens is accidental and it's meaningless. And it has no future beyond this life. Can you imagine the mindset of people that don't believe in God, their loved ones die, 
a quick 50, 60, 70 years, it's all over. Everything that you think you own has been left for someone else to own. And you walk away from a grave and you bury those that you love more than anything in this world. And that's the end. What kind of a life is that? What kind of a hope is that? It is no hope. It is no future. Thank God we don't have to sorrow as those who have no hope. Jesus, when he raised from the dead, he come back and told us, because I live, you shall live also. And he that believeth in me shall never die. I like that plan a whole lot better, don't you? I'd like to think when my quick little race is over in this world, I'm not just leaving this world, I'm just beginning. You know, they say life begins at 40. Don't you believe it? It begins when you die. Well, no, it begins when you step through the curtain of death. And you go on. To live forever. I like what R.A. Torrey said about people who don't believe God and atheists. He said, men hope by the denial of God's existence to shield themselves from the discomfort of his acknowledged presence. It's as foolish to deny God as to bury your head in the sand like ostriches do when they're frightened to try and to avoid their enemy. I mean, how stupid is that? How foolish it is to try to live a life from nothing to nothing, while at the same time, the marvelous order of regularity of God's nature and creation is verifying is proving to us every day the existence of God. And so we come back to the word of God. The world was made by him, and immediately everything makes sense with a loving God in the center of it. We are all really going somewhere on the wings of a loving God who has once nailed to a cross by a world that knew him not. I thank God I'm not going from nothing to nothing, but I'm going somewhere. And where I'm going has no end, thank God. What's out ahead of us is greater hope, a greater life than we can comprehend. It's out there, and Jesus opened the door to it. Look at the next statement. John says, he was in the world. Think about that. How many gods do you know that actually come into our world and become human flesh? There are no gods. There are no other gods. Only one God came into our world from another world, and that was Jesus Christ. Jesus coming into the world... Deity leaving its throne and coming in the form of human flesh is the greatest event in the history of the world. No greater thing happened than the day that Jesus was born. The Son of God coming into this sin-cursed world confers upon our race the highest of all honor. Matthew 1, 23, he said, Behold, a virgin shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means when that little baby hit earth, God was with us. The God of the universe, the God that dwelled with the angels, the God that is forever left all the splendor and glory of heaven and came down here to hang out with us. It's mind-boggling. 
It's beyond our comprehension that God would come. No wonder. No wonder Jesus' birth, upon Jesus' birth, troops of angels, they ran to the barrier of heaven and they looked over and they said, it's not good enough. And they come down that night and there was a whole flock of them over standing over the shepherds and they were looking down and they were singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill to men. What a moment! When Jesus came into this world and the angels said and they were praising God uh, and they said this day in the city of David a Savior is born which is Christ the Lord. No wonder one of the very stars of heaven relocated its position and came down to where the manger was and pointed like a diamond shape to show those who were looking for him, this is him. This is him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Amen. He was in the world. Which means that the God who created this world and all things that are in it would forever be united with those in the human race who accepted him as the savior of the world. Can you imagine how the apostles felt when they over that three and a half years, begin to gradually figure out that Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. Can you imagine how he blew their minds, and especially the Pharisees and the scribes who were supposed to know all about the Bible? He looked at him and he said, if you have seen me, guess what? You have seen the Father. If you've seen my character, guess what? You've seen the Father's character. If you've seen me, guess what? You see the kind of love I have. That's the kind of love my Father has. Can you imagine when they saw that? And they were trying to comprehend that that Jesus that they were with day in and day out was actually God in the flesh. Every soul needs to understand that when Jesus came into this world, he set upon our souls the greatest of all values of all the treasures of the earth. You and I, every one of us that ever came into this world, are of more value to God than all the greatest treasures of the world. That's why Jesus said... If you gain the whole world and lose your soul, what profit is it to you? Just highlighting the value that God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost place upon every one of our lives. He left the splendor of glory to come down so he could be in an association, in a relationship with you throughout eternity. That's how great our God is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For what reason? To undergo humanity, to become human and absorb all the frailties and be crucified as a sinless savior. Then John says, the world knew him not. And when you stop and think about that, the world knew him not. The Old Testament talked about it. For 4,000 years, they talked about it. It was prophesied over and over again that he was coming, the Messiah is coming, the Son of God is coming. But they rejected him. 
and their rejection and your rejection and my rejection and the whole world's rejection of Jesus Christ is totally inexcusable because our Lord lived a holy life and he displayed an impeccable character. His example was the ultimate of examples, not to mention his astonishing miracles that he performed that defied the laws of nature. I mean, stop and think. If somebody came in here and said, I'm the Lord, and then a tornado starts, and then storms start, and he goes outside and he says, hush, and the storm stops, and the tornado stops, and then along comes a blind man, and he raises him up, Impotent man, blind man, raises him up and heals him. He spoke with authority. He told the wind and the rain and the sun what to do. There was a battle going on in the Old Testament and Joshua needed daylight. And he said, Lord, can you give us a little longer daylight savings time? We'll do it. And the sun stood still. And by the looks of some of your face, you're not even excited about it. But I'm trying to explain to you the greatness, the greatness, the greatness of our God. And there's no reason in the world that we can give that would be justified to reject him. There's not a reason. It is utter foolishness. To reject a God like this. Not to mention his supernatural wisdom. How many 12-year-olds do you have that can go and talk to the Supreme Court of our country and make more sense than they make? Well, that wouldn't be hard to do, would it? I got to get something harder. Huh? Black robe don't make you smart. A position don't make you smart. Crazy things that we come up with because we got a little authority. He should have been known to Israel's scribes who should have known all the prophecies of his arrival. His life was prophesied. His birthplace was prophesied. His deeds were prophesied. His death was prophesied. Yet they failed to recognize him. Their blindness was deplorable. Israel's leaders were too proud to admit Jesus was their Messiah. And when during Jesus' trial, Pilate washed his hands of Jesus' blood... And they, when they saw that, Pilate, even Pilate had enough sense. He said, I'm done with you. I wash my hands of this man's blood. I found him to be an innocent man. Here's Barabbas. They said, no, no, crucify him, crucify him. And let his blood be on us and on our children and our children's children. And you know what happened when the Jewish nation said that? We need to understand where the Jews fit into this picture. They're in the same place that every sinner is in. They need Jesus Christ. And if they don't go through the door, they'll never get into heaven. And when the Jews said, let his blood be upon us and our children... They had no idea that they were perpetuating and transmitting an attitude that would last with them for over 2,000 years and still counting. I've got a Jewish aunt. And her husband is Tony. And I was named after Tony, Uncle Tony. And he married a Jewish woman. 
Not speaking disrespectfully, just making a point. When we would get together at a meal and Uncle Tony would come over and when we would have prayer, my aunt would get up and walk out all frustrated. And if we mention Jesus Christ, and this is the way many Jews are yet today, all you've got to do is bring up Jesus Christ as their only Savior, and you will see the sparks fly. You will see manifestations that you've never seen before. Why would just a name so disrupt, so annoy somebody like the Jewish nation? You know why? Because when they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children, they cursed themselves. You see, it wasn't like you were killing a Barabbas. You were killing God. You were killing your only way out of this world spiritually alive. So please understand, when you hear all these preachers on TV saying that, you know, the millennium's coming, the lion's going to lay down with the lamb. Uh-huh. The only time the lion is going to lay down a lamb is when he's in the lion's tummy. Don't be so ignorant. And then the prophet said, they shall not hurt and destroy in all my holy mountain. All he was talking about, taking the natures of men Wolves and lions. And they would lay down with one another. And they would get along with one another. Instead of trying to kill one another and fight one another. And they shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain. In the church of God, we are not supposed to hurt one another. Amen? But we do. In fact, we can't hurt one another enough. In fact, we can't hurt one another enough than when we go through a divorce. And I, they get mad. They get mad when I say, you've got to be a Christian. Not only when you went through your honeymoon and your gown and all everything that's going on. If things don't work out for whatever hundred thousand reasons... You still got to stay saved going through a divorce. You don't have to agree with everything. You don't have to go love each other. But you got to act like a Christian acts. Only because Jesus said, love your enemies and do good to them that despitefully use you. That's why Christianity is for men and for women. It's not for cupcakes. It's not for softies. It's for people who have made their minds up. They're going to follow the Lord whithersoever he goeth. Thank God for that. Let me hurry. I want to finish this. So John says in verse 10, the world knew him not. This failure of the Jews to recognize Jesus as their Savior had bitter consequences. The very next verse says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. In their foolish pride and sinful blindness, they mocked their very Creator, and they murdered him. So it is with the spiritual blindness of unbelievers today. Some cases they loathe and reject and wound the Savior. 
the best friend that they will ever had. Sometimes I think people refuse and delay to get saved, and probably for many reasons, because they do not fully understand the enormity and the magnificence of this so great a salvation, so great a Savior, and so great a God. And maybe part of the reason that so many people don't understand the enormity of this salvation is because enough preachers are not being serious enough to preach it or don't have enough backbone to preach it. And I don't mean arrogantly and insultingly, but to preach it. We don't, the preachers today don't even dare to bring up some of the social evils of the day some of the controversial subjects of the day. They don't even want to touch it because they're afraid of what their people may do. And they bring in, people come into funerals by the millions. And they don't even want to preach more than a 10-minute little eulogy and be done with it. A funeral is one of the best opportunities to tell people about the greatness of God. But a text like ours this morning, in which John is trying to explain the incarnation of Christ, sometimes to people who are unsaved or not familiar with the religious jargon or relig familiar with church, sometimes it could be a little difficult for them to understand. What John is teaching us is how the divine deity entered into our humanity. That process of God leaving heaven and coming down here is called the incarnation, which means being come, becoming clothed in flesh. So John is teaching us that it was the Son of God himself who was clothed in flesh and took on a human nature. And we must understand that before Jesus came into the world, he previously existed as the Son of God, co-equal with the Father. And when he was born of a human flesh, he really and truly became all man. So why did the Son of God become the Son of Man? Why did he become flesh? Why did Isaiah prophesy in the ninth chapter for, and make a distinction? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Why did God become a man? I want to give you three reasons to help you think of the enormity and the greatness of our God. First, that he might realize himself. That he might understand a little, by, a little bit about the human struggles. This reason we must touch reverently. While God is omnipotent, one commentator believes, yet something more is needed even for deity than the general consciousness of being a creator. It was because of the love he felt for us that he visited this world and redeemed us. But it is one thing to look on suffering, and it's another thing to experience suffering. Thus Christ came into the world and took up his abode with men. It was one thing for Jesus to say, I will go. There was a lamb in the midst 
And he said, Father, I will go. But God couldn't even look on sin. How in the world was he going to experience such an experience? He gave his only begotten son. And he let him be nailed to a cross. And he let all the sins of the world fall on him. And he let him feel like a sinner feels when he dies without God. Thus Christ came into this world and he took up his abode with us. He clothed himself with our nature. He lived among us. He felt our anxieties, our struggles. He wept with us, cried with us, suffered with us, and was in all ways tempted as a man like us, yet without sin. And then took on himself the state of a sinner on the cross and qualified himself as the savior of the world and the high priest that is now touched with the feelings of our infirmity. We've got a man on the right hand of God the Father who can explain to God what we're feeling down here because he was here. What a mighty God we serve. There was once a chaplain to a prison who thought the prisoners were treated cruelly more than their judges intended them to be. So he determined to live as they lived and to be punished as they were punished, although he did not commit any crime. This is probably almost exactly what our Lord did for us. Secondly, the second reason he came, the second reason he became a man in order that he might give to mankind a fuller understanding, a fuller revelation of God. Nature, in all ages and in all times and in all lands, have awakened man's curiosity to worship God and to worship the gods of their choosing. Nature could not speak, however, of God's love and his attributes and his holiness and his authority and his power. Nature could not identify God's person. And so men built their altars to multiplicity of idols of every kind because they couldn't get a hold of what this God, this God they saw in nature and in the sun and in the moon and in the celestial being, they, they just couldn't get a hold of it. So God came down in this world so they would get a first-hand revelation of what it was really like in person. God's nature could not, I mean, the nature itself could not speak of God's love and all the attributes. The nature, through nature, they could not relate to divine authority. They couldn't understand God's goodness. How do you see God's goodness in nature? Sometimes nature can be cruel. They could not make a relational connection to God as a heavenly father. The full knowledge of the love of God never was known until it was revealed to us in the face of Jesus Christ. Everywhere Jesus went, he said to people in John 14, 9, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And lastly, the most important reason why God became man in Christ, that he might redeem us and atone us for our sin. 
through the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ to the law of God, he fully met all the requirements to secure our pardon from sin, and he died as the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. The only way that God could redeem us is deity, pure, undefiled deity come down in this world and Jesus become the Lamb of God, the sacrifice that took away all the sins of the world. Do you realize what it's costing you to be saved? Do we even have a glimpse of what it means to have a God like this? And yet we don't even have time to worship him. We don't even have time to read and pray. We don't even have time to serve him. We're so entangled. Wake up. And lastly, that he might atone us. In Matthew 20, 28, Jesus explains his reason for coming into this world. He said, I come to give my life a ransom for many. Only through Jesus Christ. I'm closing. Sherm, if you'll come. I want you to listen carefully. In Wales, there is a romantic village called Bethgirlert. The name which means the grave of Gilert. There is a famous legend about this dog called Gilert. He was the hound. He was the pet. He was the dog of Elwellyn, the great prince of northern Wales. One day he went on a hunting trip without Gilert. And Gilert was unaccountably absent didn't know why. On Llewellyn's return, the truant dog, stained and smeared with blood, joyfully sprang to meet his master when he returned. The prince alarmed and hastened to find his child and saw the infant's cot empty and bedclothes and floor covered with blood. And the frantic father plunged his sword into the hound's side. He plunged his sword into Gilert, his dog, thinking it had killed his son, the heir to the throne. And the dog, dying, his yelping, was answered by the child's scream. Llewellyn searched and discovered his boy unharmed. But nearby lay the body of a mighty wolf, which Gilert slain to protect Llewellyn's son. The prince, filled with remorse, is said to never have smiled again and buried Gilert on his estate. In his blind rage, Llewellyn had killed a faithful friend. But in a far more terrible sense, that is what all Christ rejectors are doing today. If you are not saved, why? What is it that you're holding on to that is more important than God? What in this world, what beggarly element in this world could be worth losing your soul over? And yet people are going to lose their souls. Because the devil has convinced them that they've got time. And this will work itself out in time. It's too big a risk. Amen. 
in their awful spiritual blindness, they are rejecting their truest friend and savior. You guys can come and start playing, Brent, if you will. John said, the world knew him not. And what was true then is true today. Many are still rejecting the Savior because they have no time or desire or convenient season to serve them. But thank God there is something else that is true. There were those who did recognize him and received him. Look at verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe, keep believing, keep living like him. And here we are, over 2,000 years down the road, and time is running out. According to gospel, prophecy, and revelation, time is just about run its course. And he still gives to souls power to become the sons of God. So I want to ask you as I close, how in the world then can we, after reading John's account and seeing the greatness of all God has done for us in Jesus Christ, how can anybody walk away from a God like this? How can normal, intelligent human beings, knowing the consequences of rejecting Jesus Christ, walk away from him? We should do our very best. We should do our very best, church, to surrender our hearts to a Savior like this. We should do our best to serve him with all of our heart to love him, to obey him. We should do our best to tell the world about him. Nothing, nothing in this world comes close to losing our soul over. I hear a thousand reasons why people don't have time for God. And not a one of them, in compared to eternity, in comparison to the goodness of our God, not a one of them can even stand in court with our God. And look at the things, look at the idols, Look at the entanglements that people come up with. Well, I can't. I've got this to do, and I've got that to do. And I've got this, this role to play and this, this job to perform. Do you understand me? Nothing. You can gain it all. You can gain all there is in this world to gain. But if you're not ready to meet God, you're like that ostrich that has his head buried in the sand. And because he can't see the consequences, he thinks they're not there. But they're there. And if something should happen, and for some reason you, lose, you leave this world unexpectedly, tragically, in a moment, in a flash. As you leave this world, you're going to be throughout eternity. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power. 
power. Isn't that what we need? Something convincing, something strong enough, something believable. Give us the power to say goodbye, old world. I'm through. Goodbye, sin. Goodbye, all the advantages, all the economics. Goodbye. I'm not going to allow anything to cause me to lose my soul. And yet millions and millions and millions of people are going to lose their soul because they're too busy. Ridiculous. Don't put your sword into the side of your best friend. Have enough guts and enough courage and enough humility and enough understanding that all your addictions and your habits are not worth it. And let Jesus Christ give you the power to become a son of God. Amen. This is a package you can't be in a billion years. In the beginning was the word. And you know something? In the end, we're all going to meet this same word. Heaven and earth are going to pass away, but this word is going to be looking every one of us in the face. If there was anything hindering my experience that I was aware of, and God makes me aware as I live, and I have to continually make adjustments. But if I had something standing in my way this morning, and you know what it is, and God knows what it is. And it may be something that you love more than anything else in this world, but it still isn't worth it to lose your soul. I'm talking about getting saved, folks. I'm talking about loving God. I'm talking about surrendering. I'm talking about the gentleness and the love that Jesus Christ displayed and the sacrifice that he made so you and I could be set free this morning. Amen? How about it? If there's anything, I, if there's anything that's questionable, that's in the gray area, come and let the Lord know you'd be willing to do business with him. But don't risk losing your soul. Amen? Hey, it's wake up time. It's wake up time in this world. We go out there and the minute we hit the vestibule, it's all history. The solemnity of every service becomes history. But one of these days, It's going to be an awakening. And as your pastor, I don't want you to miss it. You don't want to miss it. Those that are praying for you don't want you to miss it. The church doesn't want you to miss it. All the angels in heaven don't want you to miss it. So while we sing, why don't you just take a moment and come down here and bring your problem to the Lord and watch the salvation of the Lord be turned loose in your life. Fair enough? Then let's stand and 
Let's give some folks an opportunity to pray. Page number 62. 62. God bless you as we say. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince Listen. of glory died, my richest gain. I count but loss and poor contempt of all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast. Save in the death of Christ, my Lord. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood see from his head his hands his feet sorrow and love flow mingled down Did such love and sorrow me or thorns compose so rich a crown. One more verse. 